pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, for reports and correspondence, um, we just only had a meeting a couple weeks ago. We may not have much, but I just wanted to mention um, the Memorial Day parade yesterday and uh, publicly thank uh, Jimmy Cox for organizing it and thank all of the participants. Um, it's one of the most wonderful things I think that this town does every year and um, I'm always quite moved when I see everyone lining the streets and honoring our veterans so uh, thanks to everyone for making that a very special occasion but especially Jimmy Cox for once again organizing it. Does anyone else have any reports or correspondence? Jim? Uh, yeah, a week ago last Saturday Manager McGovern and I attended the annual Fire Department Appreciation Night. Uh, this brought back some good memories for me as, as I was on the Fire Department when I first got out of college uh, too many years ago. But it's great to rekindle friendships and uh, renew acquaintances, and uh, it's a great bunch of people. I enjoyed myself thoroughly. Thank you. Marianne. Paul. Um, tomorrow, there's going to be a news conference held at 11 a.m. at the Portland Police Department, and it's going to be um, about the regional crime lab that, that has been approved. And I just wanted to let everybody know that 20, 22 communities in Cumberland County have signed on and it's going to, you know, it's going to be a great resource. It should help us solve crimes more efficiently, more quickly, and it's going to be a great resource. And it's a great example of regional collaboration. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. And I would just mention a reminder once again that um, Wednesdays in June, the uh, school board's wellness committee will be sponsoring walk or ride your bike to school on every Wednesday in June, so I'm just putting this out here, asking motorists to be particularly aware on um, Wednesdays coming up, starting a week from tomorrow, um, and it will be great to see the kids walking and riding their bikes to school. So. Okay, um, the next item on our agenda is citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. If there is anyone here who would like to bring something to the council's attention that is not on our agenda, um, this is an opportunity for you to do so. Um, and we, um, we will be going into executive session at the end of our agenda. So although we also offer an opportunity to do so at the end of the meeting, um, you would have to wait until after our executive session. So um, this is um, a good time if anyone would like to address the council. Okay, we will move on to the public hearing on the sign ordinance. And this is item um, 83 and we have a draft sign ordinance. I don't know, Cynthia, if you want to um, open well, this up happy, or? Happy to, um, to speak. I, I walked over and tried to uh, reduce the load, and I was assuming <laughs> that there was a, a proposed draft in the packet, but there's not, but I yeah. actually can. Would you like prefer. mine? Um, I think I can pretty much, um, I have it committed to memory. Okay. The, um, the Cape <laughs> Fifth Farm Alliance, as we all know, is a dynamic group that has been working to um, sort of coordinate the efforts of our local farms, and it produced a fabulous report that um, sort of documented um, the number of farms and other agricultural operations that included, I believe, um, 10 or so growers and about 16 horse owners. And um, they have a number of initiatives that include things from um, working in the schools and educating the public and outreach. And one of the areas that is of concern and study is to how to um, streamline local regulations in order to help farms and growers um, develop their business. And so the Alliance met with the Ordinance Committee and made some suggested recommendations to our sign ordinance so that um, local growers and other agricultural businesses could um, advertise um, their businesses. And so what they did and what we did as an Ordinance Committee was went through the sign ordinance and made some um, revisions which appeared in the packet as um, italics and underlined. And, uh, Essentially what the Alliance wants is an expansion of the number of signs during the growing season, 
Um, there is an, a, a, a change in the definition of agricultural operations to sort of cover the, the, the varied types of um, rural enterprise that are included in the, in the Farm Alliance and, um, and the other changes that are set forth in the proposed draft. So um, I had um, initially some questions about the, um, the number of signs. There's, there's a, an, a will or a desire on the far part of the Alliance to have more signs during the growing season within the uh, right of way to direct people to where these places are. And, uh, but I was convinced that, um, that that's, in fact, a good idea and necessary to further the town's goal of maintaining our rural character and supporting our farm. So I'm looking forward to hearing the members of the Farm Alliance who are here to speak tonight. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. If there is anyone here who would like to speak to um, the sign ordinance proposed changes, uh, Please come up, state your name, and um, where you live. I am uh, Penny Jordan, and I am uh, one of the owners of Jordan's Farm. I live on Fowler Road, but I live most of my time at 21 Wells Road. Um, I just wanted to express, uh, number one, that uh, the gratitude from the uh, Kipplesworth Farm Alliance uh, to the council for all of your support. And we know that when we ask that uh, the sign ordinance be expedited so that ideally if it were uh, something that the council would consider passing, that it's something we could implement this season. Uh, the farm stands are already open. Um, many of them have flowers. Uh, uh, a few have some vegetables from um, outside communities, but they're all local at this point in time. But the farm stands are open, and the sooner that we can move forward with getting uh, signs up so that we can direct people to the uh, various farm stands and business entities, then um, we are hoping to have probably... Uh, I'm not, farmers aren't supposed to say this, I'm hoping to have one of the most successful seasons we've had because the uh, stars are lined up. Um, and one of the things as we were going through the uh, work of the Cables with Farm Alliance is that uh, New Hampshire had done their checklist and we always check back against this to see uh, um, Cape Elizabeth is an extremely farm friendly town. And one of the areas where it can demonstrate its ongoing support is uh, that it allow uh, more off-site signs to direct people to the businesses. Um, so I think we are here, myself, my sister Carol, uh, Nancy and Kelly, and we are here to answer questions that you may have regarding the sign ordinance and to ask for your ongoing support of this effort. So thank you. Thank you, Penny. Um, we probably should have a motion. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? We should probably have a motion before we start our, our discussion. Cynthia? I move that the council approve the requested changes to the town sign ordinance as set forth in the um, draft, and that's um, chapter 21 relating to signs. Second. Okay, that'll be um, Councillor Rose second, since he has worked so hard with the farm committee. Okay, discussion. David. I have a few questions, and it might be helpful if Penny Shoot. helped answer Penny, these as well about a then. few specific provisions. Please. Um, and I don't have many. There are really just a few places that I have questions about the wording. Um, and the first one is on the definition of agricultural operations. Mm -hmm. And it's... The, the definition refers to the production, keeping, or maintenance of plants and or animals mm -hmm. or activities, and it goes on. But I'm focused on the plants and or animals language and wonder whether, I imagine that you 
as a committee tortured yourself over all these words. Yes, we but, acted like lawyers the whole time. Yes. That's good. <laughs> but I was wondering if we might do better by saying plants, comma, agricultural produce, comma, livestock and poultry. The reason I'm not really fond of the word animals, um, for example, what if somebody breeds poodles and they want to put up all the signs that are permitted by this ordinance for agricultural operations? I think they'd be entitled to because they're breeding animals for profit. Could you but, restate, David? Your but, but I think the goal here is to protect farming operations. Exactly. Um, and the only animals that I think are a concern would be livestock and poultry. But horses. Are uh, horses not horses? considered livestock? L horses are livestock. I would, so. I would say they're livestock. Do you agree, Kelly? Yeah. Um, what about bees? Bees, that's why I'm sorry, I lost job. That is why we said animals, because of the animal farming and the bees. They wouldn't be an animal, would they? Yeah, be bees, I wouldn't think, would be under any definition animals, livestock, or poultry. I got it. Yeah. What was it? You said agricultural. You, you said, uh, said plants, plants, produce? Agricultural produce. Produce. Livestock and poultry. Livestock and poultry. Cynthia? I, I'm not sure, but I believe if somebody wanted to um, produce, keep, or maintain poodles, that, um, that that's a zoning issue. Like right now, I, I, I'm not stating this as a fact, but I'm wondering if, in fact, um, the agricultural operations that are currently allowed in the town of Cape Elizabeth are the things that we're already doing, such as growing vegetables and raising horses. And, and those other things would not be included because they're not properly well, this zoned. Is, but this is just science. Right. I'm not talking about permitted uses. Yeah, but I, what I'm saying is you, couldn't, you wouldn't have to worry about a poodle sign because growing poodles is not a permitted use in the town of Cape Elizabeth, so you'd never get to the sign. Well, I don't know that it's not a permitted. I don't think it is. That somebody can't breed dogs in Cape Elizabeth. Maybe they can. Michael, but I don't shed know. some light on the, the provisions of the zoning ordinance relate to what's allowed and what's not allowed in certain areas. This is, this is specific to the sign ordinance and any of those, you know, poodle type operations, whatever you described, would also be subject to the, to the uh, overlay provisions of the, the zoning ordinance itself. I understood, but I'm not talking about the rest of the zoning ordinance. I, just, and I don't know what may be permitted under the rest of the zoning ordinance offhand. I'm just... You're just saying the way it's currently drafted, if someone was breeding poodles, as it's currently drafted, you could have off-site signs. Yeah. Well, yeah, if you were breeding children, you could too, but... Anne? I'm, I'm fine with it the way it is. And I don't know about the poodle, <laughs> poodle farming, <laughs> but um, if somebody... I really don't see what's the difference I mean, I know there's a difference, but in terms of signage, I don't see what's so different from somebody who's raising farm animals or chickens versus raising dogs. So I would be okay with poodle farming being able to put a sign out there if they're poodle farmers or whatever, you know, poodle, poodle ranchers, I guess they'd be. Um, so uh, I understand your point, but I... I think it's fine the way it is because I, I really don't understand why if somebody has such an operation why it wouldn't be okay and I think I think oh God I hesitate to open this subject but I think that bees are agri honey is an agricultural kind of product and it's so product sure. so I think bees are animals too <laughs> so Well, I'm not getting into the question of whether insects are animals. I didn't mean to go down that road. Uh, well, it's a but hot topic. My, the road that I intended to go down was simply the question of whether or not we're intended to be focused solely on farming operations. And if so, I was suggesting the, def the definition focus on farming operations. And if the 
concept is we don't care whether it's farm related or non farm related, then it's okay as is. Well, I think if we're going to allow horse breeders to put up signs, which it seems to me we would, because they'd be considered an agricultural operation, and I, and I like that it includes horse breeders, I really don't see much of a difference between horse breeders or dog breeders or bee breeders or whatever. But I'm okay with having them all included the way it is now. So, May I make a suggestion? And I realize it's some would argue that I'm using a definitional word in the definition, but if you say agricultural operations means the conduct of agricultural activities, and I offer that from the standpoint, and then you could leave plants and animals just the way it is. Uh, I mean, I'm okay with it the, the way it is, too, so. I, I would, I'm okay with it the way it is, but I wouldn't like, I hate when we have definitions that define things using I knew the you same would say word. That. <laughs> yeah. so, sorry, Madam Chair. I, <laughs> well, I, I like David's clarity, I, and that's one thing David does very well is he, he's good at bringing greater clarity to a lot of these uh, topics. And, and, you know, it just gives better definition to it. And, and for the bees, the honey, you just include agricultural products because that's what it is that you're producing. And that's what your sign says. You're not selling bees, you're selling honey, <laughs> right? right? Well, so, well, we actually have at least one beekeeper mm. in town. Do they raise bees for? Raising bees for oh. other... Oh, well, you could say insects, I guess. Farms. Or agricultural activities or products. I don't, I, don't, I don't have an objection to David's clarity, I think. I think that brings better meaning to it. But I, I think this, and then I promise I won't say anything more. I think if we're going to use the, David's definition of livestock, then I think we really need to define livestock also. And I really don't want to sort of go down that road, but I, I think livestock is not necessarily a precise term. Maybe it is in the world of agriculture, but if it is, then it should be defined. So livestock would be cows, well, horses? You know what, I, I'm hesitant pigs. to re redraft an ordinance by committee like this. Mm -hmm. but I'd rather leave it as it is, and if it if needs to be amended problem, later, then amend That's later. what I was just going Excellent. to suggest. We want to get this done tonight <laughs> for the farming season. I, I'm not even going to raise the other and points. Okay. Well, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would suggest that we adopt it as it is. We can monitor it closely. If problems develop, we can amend it, but... <laughs> let's not send it back to the Ordinance Committee and let's not try to rewrite it here. That's always a dangerous thing. Not to mention it's not fun for the people who are watching at home <laughs> or here. So, if there's no further discussion, all in favor? V70. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Committee. Thank you, Jim. I know you're and spending a lot of time on this, so. They have the signs in the backs of their cars, I think. I want to see those signs out tomorrow morning. 30 days. 30 days? It's not effective. You mean the ordinance is not effective for 30 days. What do we need to do to make it an emergency effective ordinance? It is, yeah, we have provisions to do that. There's a lot of legalese that you need to prepare affecting that an emergency exists that affects the life uh, health and uh, safety of the citizens of the community. Well, the well-being. I, I would think that an emergency does exist. <coughs> Farm stands are open. It has started. This affects their well-being. And I would like to propose that we adopt it as an emergency ordinance so that signs can go out. If, if, if you do adopt it as an emergency, you, you also need to hold another public hearing subsequent to this. You know, I just, you know, we, we have better things to do with our time than going out and forcing any signs to slip out in the next 30 days. The only reason I mentioned that it was 30 days was specifically because what, what said you put said, out put tomorrow. out signs tomorrow and technically, you know, ordinances okay. take effect 30 days. But, we, you know, we, we tend to follow the intent of the council and we're not going to be out there. Uh, you know, the signs would get lost. If they put them out in the next two weeks, they're lost with all those... Uh, Political signs. signs all over the place anyway. Okay. Are we...
and they Is do have the right to put out happy? certain signs now. Yes. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll withdraw my motion. <laughs> okay. The next item on our agenda is the budget. And that would be item number 70, which was tabled from May 12th. Oh, it was. Items, item 70 through 74. <coughs> and we've had lots of discussion. We've had... Uh, Thank you. Um, the managers reminded me we need to move to take it off the table. Is there a motion? To, let's remove all four at one time. Cynthia? I move that we take the four budget items that appear on the agenda off the table. That would be items 70 through 74. I guess that's five. Second the motion. All in favor? 7-0. If I might add before it gets confusing. Those five items are all incorporated into this one item, but they were all tabled to this meeting. But the motion okay. incorporates all five items. But if, I need a clarification here. I was watching the South Portland Council meeting on TV one night, um, and they voted uh, these 11 things separately. Do we need to vote these all separately? They need to be in separate paragraphs that you're approving. If you wish to vote on them all separately, you're welcome to do it. But, uh, oh. you know, we, we assume that it'll be the, the same vote for each one, unless okay. you tell us differently. Okay. So we could vote them all together yes. as well. Okay. Is there a motion? Madam Chairman? Yes. Uh, before we get into motions, could I make a brief comment, please? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, I sent an email to the council uh, notifying you of my interest in restoring some level of funding to the Arts Commission. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think we should have a motion first on the budget, well, and then that would be part of I just wanted to get a, sense, a straw poll sense if there was any interest in doing that. Uh, I thought it might save us time down the road, making motions, withdrawing motions, and so forth. Okay. Is it, but I trust Go for it, then. I trust it's, it's uh, I just wanted to gain a, a sense of the council's pleasure on this. Um, as you know, and as a cost-cutting measure, we uh, considered completely withdrawing funding for the, for the Arts Commission. Uh, we typically or have been giving $3,000 in support. And uh, while I don't believe that the Commission should be exempt um, from our significant budget pressures this year, I do believe that uh, vaporizing the entire budget uh, may be overreaction. And uh, after listening to testimony at the May 12th public hearing and after reading several of the emails we received over the past several weeks, from art supporters, I believe I underestimated the effect of the Arts Commission uh, and the effect that it had on our community. Um, and I think that the effects that they've had on our town uh, may be uh, greater than what I had originally thought. Um, I, I think this may well be worth some level of town investment uh, yet. I do think that perhaps there might be some benefit to guiding the uh, Arts Commission in dispersing its public funding, particularly with regard to the desire for as much community-wide return on our investment as possible. Uh, I think that's a definite consideration. Anyway, what I'm proposing, and, and with respect to our bottom line tax situation, is a smaller investment in our Arts Commission of, of and I would propose $2,000. And I just would ask if there was any interest in, in bringing that up uh, under a motion as we discuss the budget. Well, if you want to make that as a motion, we'll see if there's a second okay. about that. I would that's so one way to see whether there's interest. I, I second the motion. I, I and I, I agree with Jim. I think um, we underestimated the interest and the support for the arts. I was quite impressed. I know it's been a problem for a number of years to have the Arts Commission to be an active, uh, play a real active role. Um, and I think the current commission wants to do just that, and I, and I support that. So I, I agree that some level of funding should be restored if we can find the money somewhere else, and maybe, Jim, you've got a suggestion. So, so uh, just clarification for me. You're supporting it if he can convince the council to take it out of some other area of the budget? I, I think... That so you're not saying you want to increase the budget? I, I don't really want to increase the budget. Okay. No, I, I thought Jim had 
ideas of getting that money somewhere. No, my intent was to, to add it back into the Was motion. it an addition? Mm -hmm. So are you still seconding the motion? At that level? At, did you say $2,000? 2000 right. I'd be open to, to negotiation on that, too. I, I, I just hate to see the budget disappear completely, because I think it presents some problems in, in reestablishing yeah. it down the road. Yeah. Um, it gives us a little guideline. Um, yeah, I, I would support that, yes. I, I, that is a second. Okay. Thanks. Discussion? Dan? I, I emailed the manager about this because I wanted to make sure I understood whether it was still his proposal or not to eliminate the funding. And he said it was. Um, we had asked him to make some significant cuts and to operate within some significant constraints and it was his best judgment that this, among other things, a number of other things, were um, items that he felt, while worthy, um, could, were not as high on the, uh, on the list as other things that he wanted to preserve. And so I um, am going with, with his judgment on this. And that is not to say that I don't value the arts or um, that I think that the that I don't think that the Arts Commission has done a good job. I, th I think they have, especially um, in this last year. I'm sorry. Should I speak up, David? I don't know if you can hear me. No, I'm sorry. Um, they have done a good job, but in the same way that we could not allocate money to the farm um, group when they uh, wanted when they came to us and they forged onward on their own and did an excellent job without funding from the council. I think the Arts Commission or citizens who are interested in the arts may well have to follow that course. Um, again, it's not a criticism of them. I think they have done a good job, but it just, in my mind, uh, does not rise to the level of some of the other needs um, that uh, I perceive as uh, more pressing at this time. So I will not be supporting the motion, regretfully, but not. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, David and Sarah. Um, as small as the amount is, um, and as interested as I know some citizens are in seeing the Arts Commission continued, um, for the same reasons that I've talked about small amounts in other aspects of the budget, I don't support adding additional amounts for the funding. To the extent that there are important elements of what the Art Commission, Arts Commission has done, um, I would be more interested in asking that those sort of more essential roles be continued uh, by our library uh, board of trustees. Um, and I'd be more inclined to make that request of the library board than I would be to add additional funding uh, to resurrect or to continue the funding of the Arts Commission. Sarah, did you want to say that? I guess I agree with Jim. I, I, would, I, I, think, I think to get rid of it makes it extremely hard to then get it back. I'll be voting against it. I think uh, Anne has made a very good point about what the Farm Commission has done. And so I would just encourage that kind of activity. They have done so much with um, no funding. So um, I, it's a hard year. And for all the reasons that David said, I will not support putting it back into the budget. Paul? I, um I, I need to say that um, initially I was against supporting the Art Commission. I was in favor of, of cutting the funding, but I was persuaded by the enthusiasm of the people on the Commission, and, and they really made a good case, and that changed my mind. And, and I have to say that typically in tough budget years, the arts, in music, in those things that um, we consider less, I don't know, for lack of a better term, definable, you know, 
it, whether it's in academics, in an academic setting or in a community, uh, those get cut first. But those are the things that make life rich, richer. And, 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 and I think um, the current art commission that we have is a very effective group. They're very committed to what they're doing. And they're doing a very good job. And I am inclined to support them for that reason, for those reasons. Okay, um, if there's no further discussion, all in favor? I'm sorry, what was the motion? The motion is to Jim's restore $2,000 to the okay. arts budget, so sorry. all in favor? One, two, three, four. It passes. Opposed? Four, three. And I see the hands Jim. going up. Thank you. All, all opposed. Oh, I'm all sorry. opposed? <laughs> four, three. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm in a trance. <laughs> okay. Now we get to someone want to offer a main motion, and I think um, the item A could serve as the main item A on page one could serve as the main I motion. I make a motion that we pass the FY 2009 proposed budget. You want me to read it? Or? As, well, I would just say as amended by the added addition of $2,000 to the arts. Yes. Boards and commissions. Yes. So the Boards and commissions. <coughs> and then just as further set out on pages 1, 2, 3, and 4. Thank you, Marianne. How's that? Does that, that work, Michael? Mm -hmm. That work? Okay. So that's the motion. The minutes there, will reflect it's this whole motion. Is there a second? And to, thank you, Cynthia. Okay. And to be clear for those who are here and for um, the public that may be watching at home, the motion that has been um, just put out would um, increase uh, municipal spending by 3.4 percent. It would increase school spending by 4.6 percent. Now, is there discussion? Madam Chairman? Yes, Paul. I want to say that um, this budget year was a difficult one. We're faced with declining revenues at the municipal level and no real new sources of revenue um, in the foreseeable near term. So when we came up with the budget, it was a compromise budget, as, as most of them are. Some people wanted to spend more money. Some people wanted to spend less money. We listened to a lot of committed people, uh, committed members of the community who came and spoke to us you know, regarding their concerns. We received numerous emails. Some asking us to pass a 6% school budget, some asking us to pass either a 4.6 or something less than that. And, you know, we could have seven different opinions here. And I know everybody feels strongly about their position. But when, when it comes to governance, because we're a council, we have to have a majority. And I think it's important that individually we're willing to give up some of our personal position to gain a position that can, you know, can be passed and can help <coughs> move the community forward. And I feel like that's what this budget is. So I would ask my fellow counselors that had different positions to reconsider that and vote for this budget. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Cynthia? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's hard to believe that this is actually my last budget vote as a town councilor, as I will not be seeking re-election in November. And um, I think saying that voting on the budget is fun is a little bit of a stretch, but it does, um, in many ways, um, 
uh, sort of stretch your thinking, and, um, and I've, I've really appreciated the opportunity to, um, to work with all of you on this year's budget and in the budgets in the years past. And I wanted to thank everyone who wrote or emailed or called or stopped me in the IGA and um, made their opinions known about the budget. I think there's been an evolution in my own mind of an appreciation for budgets in general, uh, not only the Cape Elizabeth budget, but of course the budget of our state in relation to other states and in relation to um, other towns, obviously. And um, I'm especially um, grateful to the high school students who came forward and spoke at the public hearing. I think they just did an amazing job at um, advocating for something that they believed in and um, demonstrated to me that our tax dollars are well spent when it comes to education. I think um, every student who spoke was um, very impressive and I learned a lot and I wanted to sort of give them a message about the process that um, I've learned uh, through some hard knocks that even if the 6% budget isn't approved tonight, which it doesn't appear that it will be, that their job in advocating for something that they believe in doesn't end, that they then have the opportunity to look towards the school board who is going to be given a $19 million budget to work with and make the case that in setting priorities that this particular teacher that they're fond of or this particular program that they're fond of should be moved to the top. And so I encourage them to continue their effort and not lose sight of their goal, which is to um, make it known what programs and um, teachers that they feel are important. And I hope that they will continue to, to fight that fight um, and see it through to the end. Um, this year in particular, I think, is, is sort of exciting to me because we're going to have this budget validation vote on June 10th which, as many of you know, is the result of the school consolidation law, which I was heavily involved with as your state representative in Augusta. Um, I think um, it wasn't too long ago that the impending mandatory consolidation was on the horizon, and it was um, challenging um, and very exciting and very rewarding to um, pass legislation that exempted certain schools, including Cape Elizabeth, for being high-performing and efficient, which um, spared us consolidating with another district, which I think is essentially a, a really good thing for Cape students. Um, but part of that consolidation law and part of this compromise that we all do as policymakers was to let some other things kind of come in that may, may not seem to be that great, one of them being this horrific scheduling of the the vote that our town clerk has to put up with, and I again apologize for that, <laughs> Ruthie. Um, but nevertheless, there is going to be a budget validation, and I think that's great because all the citizens will have the opportunity to take responsibility for this budget. And by that, I mean um, in the role of town councilor and state representative, it's very different from being a school board member. I mean, you're essentially asked to sort of climb the ladder and take a view from the balcony of the big picture. And what I've learned as a state representative is that the big picture in Maine is um, colored to a large extent by tax burden and people's perception of tax burden. And there are arguments all over about whether we're the heaviest burdened community or state or whether we're 19th if you exclude the federal taxes or if you pull out the municipal. The bottom line is almost everyone you stop on the street would say that our taxes are too high and that we are not friendly to business. And so um, all of the people who have voiced those concerns to me and have stopped and said, why can't you people in Augusta just reduce our taxes, now have the opportunity to go into the polls and approve a budget that, in my view, um, has a direct impact on the tax burden. Um, and so if you want to spend more on schools, that's a perfectly legitimate position to take. But then you need to take responsibility for the numbers that demonstrate that our tax burden is very high. <laughs> um, I wanted to just also just say that the message that was made to me by the students and teachers and parents and the citizens, that there's not enough money for the school system that they believe our children deserve, I hear and I believe that 
with the uh, mandates that are imposed by the federal government and the state government, with the rising cost of fuel, with the benefits, especially health care, um, with the previous um, restrictions on the budget, that there's, there's very little to work with, and, and that the ideas and the energy that the, the school wants to put into our students, they're, they're prevented from doing because of the lack of funds. I really do hear that message. Um, Unfortunately, I think all of us in the state of the economy, with the war and the recession and our state revenues being significantly lower than they have been, we're all in a position, whether we're a parent um, running a household or a policymaker, of making some serious and difficult decisions. And I don't envy the superintendent or the other school board members who have to decide what to do with a less amount of money than they hoped for. Um, and, and I'm sorry about that. Um, and I just want people to understand that by voting for an amount that's less than what was requested of the school board is in no way an indication or a signal that my support for the schools has somehow lessened or that I'm not committed to excellent schools, because I am. I have two children in the schools, and I care deeply about the quality of education in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm supporting the compromise uh, position because, like Paul said, as one of seven in a majority rules uh, type of government, you try to have your vote count for something. And by not supporting a compromise position, then there's the likelihood, at least in my opinion, based on my experience and judgment, that the actual number would be less. And so I'm going to uh, sort of use my vote to what I see as, as move um, funding in, in the direction of the schools as much as we can bear as a community. The collective wisdom of the council being, you know, the majority of, of the policymakers. So um, I'm supporting the compromise. Um, I, um, I urge everyone to go out and vote, either in ap uh, by absentee ballot or on June 10th, and make their voices heard again about, um, about the budget. Um, and then finally, I just want to Two things that need to be clarified about the state law. One is people have been urging us as a council to just put on the ballot a 6% budget increase. And it's um, my uh, belief, based on my review of the law, that that, in fact, cannot happen unless a majority of the town council votes on a 6% budget. We don't have the option of just putting a 6% budget increase on the ballot. The law states that the, the budget amount that appears on the ballot has to be the amount that's voted on by a majority of the local legislative body, which in our town is the town council. So um, again, I just want to thank everyone who came out and expressed themselves and the other town councilors uh, for their work on this budget. And um, I am going to be supporting the compromise budget of 4.6 percent, unless there's um, some discussion that leads us in a different direction uh, uh, towards the six. Um, um, and that's all I'll say. Thank you very much. Hey, okay. Anne, and then Jim, and then I'll look to the other side of the table. <laughs> and David. <laughs> thank you. Um, like Cynthia, I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to uh, share their views, whatever they are, on the school budget with me. I have considered everyone's input carefully and I've also considered the following factors in deciding how to cast my vote tonight. First of all, the first fact that I th thought about was that school expenditures have grown over 33 percent in the last six years. That equals more than 12 percent growth in constant dollars, inflation adjusted dollars. Reasonable people can disagree about whether or not that real growth has been too much or too little but the fact remains that sustained real growth has indeed taken place. The second thing I thought about was that during the same time period that we've had that growth, enrollment has basically been flat. It's been declining since 2006 when it was 1,847 students. Next year it's predicted to drop by 55 more students for the third year in a row, down to 1,726 students. The school department predicts this decline will continue over the next few years. And as a result, enrollment per regular teacher has decreased more than 8% since 2003. The third factor I thought about was that our tax base in town is almost all, 97%, homeowners, 
with little commercial business to share the tax load. And what that means is that families who own homes are the ones who are going to have to pay whatever bill we send them, tax bill we send them. Fourth thing I thought about was that 19 percent of Cape Elizabeth homeowners in 2006, the last year that we have available information on, received circuit breaker program health. And for those of you who don't know, that's an income-based tax burden relief program. So about one-fifth of Cape households were looking for relief because they obviously felt their property taxes were a burden to them. And last, and Cynthia alluded to this, it's an incredibly difficult economy right now. There's basically a recession facing Cape citizens, including parents. So the issue here is not whether we cut. The issue is tonight is about how much more do we spend? Because we're, t we're all talking about an increase. It's just the size of the increase of the school budget that we're talking about. The fact that the school board itself was split 4-3, with three thinking that their proposed 6% budget was too high, shows how hard coming to a consensus in this economic climate is. Tonight's proposed school budget before the council um, from the Finance Committee is a 4.6% increase. That's an increase that likely exceeds the rate of growth in many Cape citizens' incomes. I would venture probably the majority, particularly for those who live on fixed incomes with growth determined by the Consumer Price Index or who depend on monthly Social Security benefits, payments which rose this year only 2.3%. I oppose the 4.6 percent spending increase as too high. That would give us a total tax increase of 5.4 percent. Given all the factors previously mentioned, I, I believe that 4.3 percent spending increase is appropriate. Um, one last comment on process, which Cynthia touched on also. But I still keep having people asking me about it, so I'll mention it because maybe somebody will hear it on TV or get to hear it, see it, read it in the newspapers. Under the new state school consolidation law, uh, the, the budget approved tonight by the council, as Cynthia said, will go to the voters on June 10th for an up or down vote, you know, a yes or no vote. If voters reject this budget, the council will need to approve a different budget which will then be submitted to the voters again, and so on and so on, until one is finally approved. The June 10 ballot will have a second advisory question asking voters whether they think that the 4.6 percent budget increase, if it's passed tonight, is too high or too low. If a 4.6 percent increase is just about right for you, a yes vote on question one will tell us that. Citizen response to the second advisory question will help us determine what the next budget proposal should be if the June 10th proposal fails. So in summary, I guess I'd say that, as we all agree, these are important questions on which reasonable people can disagree. I encourage everyone to vote on both school budget questions on June 10th. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let David, because okay. he hasn't had a chance. Oh, I'm sorry. First Jim and then David. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I've been acutely aware of the challenging circumstances of this economy since uh, before this budget season began. Uh, my own industry has been in a pretty severe recession for the past 18 months, and there's no doubt that as a town councilor, that situation has helped uh, shape my own thoughts and actions. And that probably is the main reason why I have consistently supported a 4.3 percent uh, spending increase for our departments throughout this budget process. Um, this should not be seen as an indictment of our, the budgets that have been submitted by our departments. Uh, on the contrary, I think our department heads, our town manager, our school superintendent, our school board have done an excellent job in identifying needs. They really have. The needs are there. Um, but my mantra all along through this budget process has been, what is the context? What is the context? I called the meeting before the, we even started talking numbers this budget season and tried to uh, enforce 
the context that this budget would have to take place with some of the key people in the, in the process. And, uh, you know, I can't control food or, or oil costs, but as a town councilor, I can at least try to control uh, rapidly escalating property taxes. I think that's my job, um, or part of my job. Uh, in our enthusiasm to provide a safe community with uh, the best facilities, programs, and yes, schools uh, possible, I don't think we can abandon those in our community uh, for whom property taxes are, are problematic. Um, I just don't think public policy can do that. And when you're setting a public budget, that is setting public policy for the next year, financially. Um, if we do abandon those people, I think we might as well put a sign on the front of our town hall that says people of modest or even average means are no longer welcome to live here, because that's basically what we're saying. And I'm not going to take part in hanging that sign. Now, I'll, I'll concede that various uh, communities have different needs and circumstances, so the numbers I'm going to run by you here uh, are probably not totally fair, but uh, I do want to run these numbers by you because I think they, they are important. And I also understand that numbers can, can say what you want them to say, and I, I'm fully aware of that. But our town council is considering an increase in school spending of 4.6%. This increase is 9.3% higher than the 4.21% average increase in 10 other greater Portland communities. These are Portland, South Portland, Scarborough, Westbrook, Wyndham, Gorham, Falmouth, Cumberland, Yarmouth, and Freeport. Our school board has proposed a 6.0% uh, spending increase for our schools, and this increase would be 42.5% higher than the average increase in school spending of those same 10 communities. The tax rate increase needed to support the council proposed budget of 4.6% spending increase for schools. The tax rate increase is 5.4%. This is 84% above the 2.94% average rate of increase in nine other greater Portland communities. Cumberland did not submit data here because they were going through a revaluation. The school board's proposed 6.0% spending increase would contribute to an overall 6.6% tax increase in our property tax rate or 124% above the average increase of 2.94% in surrounding municipalities. Again, I understand that different communities have different needs and services, but uh, it seems to me that we might be trying to bite off a little bit too much uh, in, one, in one bite. Uh, we're trying to play catch up. I understand that. We, we were uh, under pretty severe limits for the past couple of years, and we're trying to play catch up. But I don't think we should try to get too much in one year, particularly in the current economy. Uh, Balancing community needs with affordability is not easy, but that's exactly what we must do here tonight and uh, what we as voters must do on June 10th. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. David? Um, I will support the motion and do so for a number of reasons, um, although I would have liked to have seen more. Um, when we met as the Finance Committee, I had um, proposed an increase of 4.92%, which was $60,000, roughly more than the 4.6% budget, and that was based on the salaries, benefits, energy, and fuel-related costs that were presented in the, the school budget for the upcoming year. Um, there was not sufficient support for the 9.2%. And as um, Cynthia has well described, the 4.6% budget became a compromised budget because we needed four votes to send out any budget um, for a public hearing. And we had people at 4.3, we had a 6.0, we had a number of numbers in between, and 4.6 gave us four votes needed in order for the council to be able to do business and fulfill its obligation to the voters to come up with a budget. And I support the 4.6% budget for that reason. Um, I only want to explain one aspect of my decision tonight, and that is the reason for sending the 4.6% budget rather than the 6% budget. 
uh, the, uh, the school board's proposed budget um, to the voters on June 10. The most frequent theme that we heard at our public hearing on May 12, and the most frequent theme that we've received in recent emails um, is a request that we send the school board 6% proposed budget to the voters. And more than one citizen has suggested um, that the democratic process and principles of democracy, including the concept of majority rules, mandates us to send a 6% budget to the voters. Um, nothing about the democratic process is being undermined by the council sending a 4.6% budget to the voters. To the contrary, voters will be given the ultimate democratic option of accepting or rejecting what the council sends out to vote. Under the town charter, the town council has assigned the responsibility for setting the budget for both the town and for the schools. It's the sole responsibility of the school board to decide how to spend the allocated school budget. The school board is charged by statute with being an advocate for the schools. The Town Council, on the other hand, is charged with considering other interests of the town citizens. Again, Councilor Dill described it as climbing a ladder to the balcony and taking a slightly different view. In my opinion, the Town Council would be remiss in its duties, as spelled out in the Charter, if it forwarded the school board's recommended budget to the voters as a matter of course without exercising its own independent discretion. Um, in that regard, this year is no different than previous years. But what is different this year is that as a result in the changes in state law that have already been described, voters will be given the opportunity to approve or reject the budget that we send out. And I certainly speak for myself, and I think probably for all of us, in saying that I, and I think all of us, we welcome that change in the opportunity for voter input. Um, although the May 12 public hearing seemed to be a unanimous expression of support for the school board's proposed 6% budget increase. We have approximately 3,400 households in Cape Elizabeth with more than 7,600, 7,600 registered voters. And although the public hearing may have given the impression that everyone in town supports the school board's proposed 6% budget increase, the only way for us to know with certainty what the voters think about the town council's proposed 4.6% increase is to give the voters an opportunity to accept it or reject it. And if a majority of the voters reject the 4.6% budget increase and they indicate that they think that 4.6% budget is too low, I will commit now that I will then support sending the school board's 6% proposed budget increase to the voters for approval. And if those who support a 6% budget increase are correct in their assessment that the majority of the citizens support the 6% school budget increase, then the 4.6% will be rejected as too low. If, on the other hand, a majority of the voters approve the 4.6% budget, then we'll know that citizens are satisfied with the spending restraint that's been exhibited by the council. Of course, another outcome is possible as well, and that is that the 4.6% budget increase will be rejected as too high. Um, less than two years ago, November of 06, um, as we all remember well, um, 2,100 voters in Cape Elizabeth voted to support the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which would have supported, which would have imposed a more onerous spending burden on the schools than the council's current proposed 4.6% increase. And there's fair reason to believe that a number of those 2,100 voters will think that our 4.6% increase is in fact too high. Uh, but under any outcome for the first time, we will hopefully know uh, what the citizens of Cape Elizabeth want and expect from us as their elected officials. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that the privacy of the voting booth will be a great equalizer. 
uh, where every citizen will be free to vote his or her conscience. And in the five years that I've served on the council, and for the many years, for many years before I joined the council, there's been debate and there's been contention <coughs> over the extent of the council's willingness to support and fund the school board's annual budget request. For the first time, voters will have an opportunity to provide a clear indication of the extent to which they're willing to have their taxes raised to fund the school budget. And I urge every voter in Cape Elizabeth to exercise his or her democratic right to vote either by absentee or to vote on June 10 and indicate whether they support or reject the 4.6% budget and to indicate whether they think the proposed increase is too high or too low. Thank you, David. Cynthia, you wanted to say something else? Well, I just wanted to clarify. I thought Ann said um, she encouraged everyone to um, vote on both questions that appear on the ballot. And I just want to, I, th I think if they vote to accept the 4.6% budget, then they will not. That's not true. Fact. Everybody will have the advice. Yes, everybody has the opportunity because the, the, well, the, thinking, the thinking is that some people in the spirit of compromise, as, as Paul said, will vote for the budget even though they might perhaps want to see it lower, but they want to have input on if it does fail, uh, whether the budget should go up or down. Uh, and I'll give you an example, and, and it will allude to, um, well, like, an, like a number of councillors here, this budget is a compromise budget for me. I started out in the Finance Committee at 4.3%. I moved up to 4.6% because we need to have four votes to have a budget. Um, I was comfortable that that number was not so high that um, I was asking too much of the taxpayers. I was also comfortable that it was an adequate number. But what I plan to do, Cynthia, is to vote to support the budget, but I will also vote on my advisory ballot that is too high. So, um, and I think to do otherwise would be to disenfranchise many people who are going to go in. It's not a perfect budget. It's not a perfect budget by any means, but this democracy is not a perfect process. What we try to do is compromise and come up with something that we think <laughs> will be supported by the majority well, of I, the public. I hear what you're saying, but I guess my point is that it seems to me a voter, if they're going to, if, if a voter thinks that 4.6% is excellent, why should they describe their vote or the budget adopted as too high or too low? It's well, not. It's, you know what? It's exactly because, what they want. Can I, because they want I'd like to respond to that. that. We don't even have a council that thinks 4.6% is excellent. <laughs> we have a council that will vote on a compromise. There are some members of the council who want a larger number. There are some members who want a smaller number. And that's part of a representative democracy. I uh, agree, but I, I think that it's confusing to a voter to approve a budget and then simultaneously express that the budget that they just approved is either too high or too low. That well, seems inconsistent well, Cynthia, to me. we already resolved this question already, and the ballots have been printed, and my recollection was we discussed this yes, at and if, our if last I, if I could meeting. Yes, if I could so, add, this system, as we will be voting on, has been used in other systems in the state successfully without people being confused. People, people can figure it out. It's... There's no perfect number. There's no, there's no perfect system and there's no perfect number, but um, I, I think it's important that everybody realizes they can and, and I believe should vote on both questions because we have some people advocating to vote no on the budget because it's too high and some people among the school community advocating to vote against the budget because it's too low. So the budget may well fail I mean, we don't know, but it may well fail. And then I think the school board and the council would really like to know if the next number should be higher or lower. 
That's all. So everybody will have a chance to weigh in on that. And it has been used successfully in Hampton and a number of other places in the state for a number of years, and it's worked well. <coughs> Is there any? Okay, I have a couple of comments. Um, first, I think everybody needs to understand that the current budget is going to increase property taxes by approximately 5.4 percent. So it's not a great budget. I, 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 you know, I'm uncomfortable with that number, but it is what it is, and it provides what we can provide to the school and to the town to do our job and to maintain a high level of services that are expected. Second point to take into account is that over the last three years prior to this year, we only increase taxes by approximately 2% per year. You take into account this budget, that's 2.85% over four years. That's not unreasonable. Okay? We'd, we'd, it's a little bit of catch up, but we're in a situation where that's necessary. Third, the um, people that qualified for the circuit breaker will still qualify for the circuit breaker. So that's a good thing. So those people will not be harmed uh, in, a, in a significant way by this budget. Fourth, a budget is comprised of two elements, revenue and expenses. We all know this. And the fact is our revenue sources are very slim this year. And, you know, we've got to keep a, a lid on expenses. And what, finally, what I want to point out is that um, one way to reduce our expenses as a community is to focus on things that we can do that are easy. One of those things is to recycle. I think the school system could do a, a really good job in recycling. That would save us thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a year if the school put a, a, a big push into recycling. I think citizens, myself included, need to really pay attention to what we do in terms of recycling. When we recycle items, the only cost we have as a community is the transportation, which actually has gone up significantly because of fuel costs, from K to the recycle center. That material gets recycled. The, what we get for the material reduces our overall cost of getting rid of waste, running eco-main. The, the items that we do not recycle get put into a different container and we get charged a significant dollar amount per ton and we have to pay for the fuel costs. So not to recycle is throwing money away. If, if we made a, a significant change in this one area, we would save probably two to three hundred thousand dollars a year in this community. That's a lot of money. And that would then go back, it would reduce our expenses, and then we would have more money for the things that we need and want as a community. So I urge everybody to recycle, you know, get smart and really pay attention to what you're doing because it doesn't make any sense to throw money away the way we've been throwing it away. And we do a fairly good job, relatively speaking, but that doesn't mean we do a really good job compared to what we could do. So. That's it. Okay. Um. Sarah, yes. Um, I, I will not be supporting the motion. I'd be surprised by that. Uh, and I'd just like to take a few moments to talk about why. As most of us know, <clears throat> there's an ongoing debate in this community about the will of the majority of citizens in the town vis-a-vis -vis funding the schools versus protecting folks from excessive property tax increases. I'd like to just take a minute to address some of the salient points and counterpoints in this exchange in hopes that I can clarify some of the facts and the information that appear to come up over and over again in the debate. Number one, why isn't growing at the rate of the CPIU, essentially the rate of inflation, adequate? In a nutshell, because school expenses grow faster than inflation. Because 80% of the school budget goes to salary and benefits, 
much of which is determined by rising health care costs, skyrocketing costs of fuel, salary, um, unfunded federal mandates that no child be left behind or turned away, and ever-growing demands that the school serve more and more needs of our children's emotional, social, physical, and intellectual well-being. So the yardstick we use to measure the school funding increases must be different than the one we use to measure for businesses. What about the decreasing enrollment that keeps being mentioned? At the same time that student numbers have gone down, the following demands and pressures on the schools have gone up. Graduation requirements, federal and state legislation on wellness, nutrition, physical fitness, testing requirements, student achievement, progress requirements for every student under technology requirements to support testing, curriculum, communication with parents, demands on special education programming, and increases in cost for integral components of the school's cost structure, such as food, energy, and health care, far outweighing the few students that decrease with each year. How does Cape Elizabeth stack up to our surrounding towns for school funding? In 2006 07, Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth fell below the following towns in spending per student Yarmouth, South Portland, Freeport, Falmouth, Portland, Cumberland, Westbrook, Gorham, and the state average. It falls in the exact middle of our neighboring towns for teacher salaries and regular instruction, and it is the lowest of any neighboring town for special education, transportation, and per pupil operating expenditure growth. How does our property tax rate compare to these other towns? Cape Elizabeth is the lowest of any town in the greater Portland area for spending per student versus per capita income. Although Cape Elizabeth has a lower tax rate than Yarmouth, Brunswick, South Portland, Freeport, Falmouth, Cumberland, and Gorham, higher only than Wyndham and Scarborough, our state valuation is the highest of any of these towns. What does that mean? It means that the state calculates that we have more money to spend on our schools than any other town in the greater Portland area, and yet, inexplicably, we spend less money on our children than every single one of our neighbors. Why are we falling behind our peer communities in school funding? Because for the last six years, the town council has held the tax increase to a level, to a level of increase that is too low to adequately fund our schools. What's curious to me is that the decision to do so each year is in direct opposition to the will of the majority of the town citizens. Every time an issue of the school funding has been allowed to go before the town for a vote, the majority, and in many cases a supermajority, have voted in favor of allocating money out of property taxes to fund our town schools. A few come to mind. The kindergarten wing, renovations to the high school, and turning down both Tabor and Pulaski by a large margin, tax uh, cap initiatives, stating quite clearly that they did not want to cap property tax increases. In light of that, it is all the more puzzling to me that the council followed with a three-year self-imposed tax cap that the citizens had expressly voted against in large numbers. What are the implications of funding the school at the CPIU? Bottom line, it means cuts. Firing teachers, cutting administrators, and reducing courses and programs. In order to work within the CPIU restrictions of the past three years, our schools have done the following. Put off replacing outdated textbooks, cut funding on all field trips, eliminated, eliminated replacement of outdated furniture, eliminated replacement schedule for computers, eliminated the vice principal position at Pond Cove, reduced the educational technician staff, eliminated the summer reading program for children in need of additional help and literacy, increased te teachers' duties by asking them to replace classroom planning time with lunchroom and playground monitoring duties, and instituted an athletic fee for both middle school and high school sports. To achieve the town council budget of 4.6%, the following adjust further adjustments will need to be made. The science department will sustain staff cuts. There will no longer be language arts support at the high school achievement center. The district curriculum coordinator will be entirely eliminated. Three educational technicians will be cut. The middle school Kiev program will be eliminated. Three athletic coaches coaching positions will be cut. Stipends that support speech extracurricular activity will be eliminated. Critical upgrading of our computers and technology programs will be once again put off, as will any renewal of outdated textbooks. I ask my colleagues.
Is this the Cape Elizabeth that you want? Is below average really what we seek? Is this the way we run our businesses and our law practices and our families? What's the solution? This community needs to support modest increases in property taxes each year to, ad to adequately fund our schools and therein maintain the vitality of our community and the value of our properties. Allow me to expand on the word modest. The difference between the school board and the town council budget is $265,000. To raise that through property taxes would work out to approximately a $50 increase per year for the median house in town. More modest houses would pay less. Combined with the circuit breaker program we have in place, it seems to me a reasonable, indeed a desirable, given how dependent our property values are on the well-being of our schools to expect to pay about $50 more per year to allow our schools to continue to do business as usual. And that's an important point. The 6.0% increase that the school board has requested does not add anything. It does not push us ahead with any innovating, excitive, or forward-looking initiatives. It does not move our teacher salaries out of the middle of the pack. It does not allocate extra, mo extra monies for fuel-saving infrastructure or even for current textbooks. It simply allows the school to continue to offer what they currently do, period. So where do we go from here? What we do is get out of the way and we let the system work. The state has put into place a system, complete with checks and balances, that has the potential to actually work. The school board, also an elected body, sets a budget each year. The town votes on that budget and it is either adopted or it is rejected. School board responds accordingly, either proceeding or adjusted, until a number is reached that everybody can live with. End of discussion. There's no longer a need for the council to get in the middle. All the necessary accountability is already in place. For us to insert ourselves in the middle of the process simply confuses the issue unnecessarily. As such, I would strongly encourage my colleagues to put forth the 6% budget tonight, as requested by the school board, and let the people speak clean and simple. But as it appears that that's not going to happen, I turn my attentions to the citizens and say vote. No matter where you stand on the issue, go vote. Go to the town hall anytime and cast your ballot or show up at the high school on June 10th between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. and vote. It is time for once and all to put this issue to rest. Let us determine what the majority of the Cape, Cape citizens actually want. Modest yearly tax increases to accept the superintendent and school board's recommended budgets that adequately fund our schools or a CPIU-based town council budget designed to reform property taxes in the state at the expense of our local schools. Go vote and let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, I want to thank the manager and the department heads for all of their work on the budget. I especially want to thank Sue Weatherby who's here tonight and it was Sue's last budget so um, she's retire retiring and Sue we will miss you we will miss working with you you always have the single most detailed informative budgets and that's not to diminish the information we get from the other departments but Sue can always tell you exactly how many people are taking yoga and what it will cost and um, how much we subsidize the pool. And Sue, I just thank you um, for all the work you've done, um, but um, particularly with the budget process, which is many nights of work. And thank you, Michael, also, because um, it's a lot of work putting a budget together, even if it's not a perfect budget. So I just want to remember how much everyone has worked on that. I also want to thank uh, the students and the public who came out for the public hearing. Um, the students really did a terrific job, and I have told a number of people that um, who might be interested in coming to the council that they really should take a page from the students' um, book. Um, the students were well prepared and articulate and um, represented well um, the school. So I thank them for coming and the rest of the public. I also want to thank the public um, that doesn't show up at the public hearings. Um, but those folks who call us or email us or send us snail mail or stop us in the IGA 
or at our churches or wherever we are in the community because um, we, we listen to people whether you come to a public hearing or whether you st stop us on the street. Um, I think it's the best part about small town government. So I want to thank everyone who's been involved. Um, I want to thank the school board. They have worked long and hard on their budget and I want to thank the superintendent and um, the uh, principals as well um, for all of their work in putting together the budget. I um, personally don't believe there's any extra money in the school budget. I don't think there's any fat. I think the school does a absolutely marvelous job of educating our children. Um, and I think that that um, wise management of the school um, resources and the priorities that have been chosen was validated last year, as Cynthia mentioned, when um, Cape Elizabeth was one of only three schools to be named an efficient um, and excellent school. Um, it's also been um, validated year in and year out by things like uh, U.S. News and World Report and Newsweek. And I have to say, um, I've been on the council seven years. And for seven years, there is kind of sometimes this period of the sky is falling, the sky is falling, our schools are going to um, pot. And um, every year, somewhere in the newspaper, and Elizabeth, I'd ask you to put this stuff on the front page, not on page wherever it was in the last issue. Um, we are validated. It may not be the perfect validation, but um, Newsweek is named uh, Cape Elizabeth High School in the top uh, 1,300 high schools in the nation. We're up a couple hundred places from the year before. And it's because the school department, the principals, the teachers, the parents, everyone does a spectacular job with the resources that they're given. And again, I, I do not want it to, to anyone to think that I don't value education. I think they do a terrific job. Um, and they do a terrific job with less resources than Yarmouth. And if I was a taxpayer in Yarmouth, I'd be saying, why don't we send a team down to Cape Elizabeth and find out what they're doing down in Cape Elizabeth? Um, so I think um, everyone should feel good about the things that we do, and um, we shouldn't be up here bad-mouthing the quality of the schools. Um, we have a disagreement over $260,000 in a $30 million budget. Um, but we all ought to be able to agree that um, our schools have been spectacular. Um, and, I, and I believe that they will continue to be spectacular. As I mentioned earlier, I personally thought it could have been a little bit lower. Um, but I came up to 4-6 so that we could have a budget, so that we could have uh, four votes coming out of the Finance Committee. Um, but it's a tough year, as everyone has mentioned. Um, and in this tough year, in this declining enrollment, I believe that the 4.6% increase is sufficient to maintain the quality of the school. Um, as was mentioned earlier, it, the budget amounts to a 5.5% tax increase. I don't view that as a trivial amount to uh, many people in this town. 20% of the town qualifies and receives benefits from the circuit breaker program. I encourage the voters to vote on June 10th or tomorrow. Um, you can come here to town hall. The absentee balloting is open. Um, but I also encourage the voters to think carefully as they consider this budget. Um, Watch what you wish for. I can't predict, and I wouldn't begin to predict, whether the budget will pass or not. Likewise, I can't predict whether, if the budget is defeated, it will be defeated because the advisory ballots show that people think it's too high or too low. To many of you, it may not seem like the perfect budget, but it is a compromise budget. And if the budget is defeated, it may be a budget that some of you who vote against it will wish that you had. So again, I encourage the public to vote. I encourage the public to um, 
vote for this budget. I also think there is um, a benefit to getting this budget behind us for the department, um, for the school board, for the town council, and just for the town in general. Um, but um, I, I also want to just say that, um, above all, I have an abiding respect for the democratic process, and I welcome this public vote this year. Um, I have tried in my tenure on the council to do what I think the majority wants. And I certainly um, am committing to you tonight um, that if the budget fails to follow the will of the majority as it's articulated in the advisory ballots. But I would encourage people to vote for this budget. It's a good budget. It maintains the quality of our schools. Uh, it's not a trivial uh, tax increase. And for those who think they'll vote against it because we shouldn't have any tax increase, I would also caution them it could be worse. We have tried to come up with a budget um, that maintains, and, and now I'm talking about the town services as well as the school services. It's, you know, it's not just about the schools. We've got a lot of town services that people require. And we've worked very hard as a finance committee with all of our department heads and with the school department to come up with a budget that will maintain the services that people um, demand and deserve. So um, with that, all in favor? One, two, three, four. Opposed? One, two, three. Okay. It's a vote. Thank you. Now I've lost my warrant. agenda. There's a warrant. You need to sign. Okay. So all of Thank you. Thank you. But we will be here. We are in executive session. We have one more item first. Um, so we have voted by voting through pages four. We have voted all of those items that the state, the new state law requires us to vote. And we are on item 84, which is end of year transfers. Michael, do you want to yes, um, use this? Article 5, Section 8 of the, the Charter of the Town of Cape Elizabeth provides that amounts can be transferred to different departments uh, within, I believe, it's 60 days of the, the end of the fiscal year. Uh, as we're now projecting to, to June 30, the way the council provides the the, as you just did, the approvals on the municipal side of the budget, you give so much to each department, and it's that overall number that can't be exceeded. Uh, we do have four of the municipal departments out of, you know, the, the long list that look like they'll be over budget on June 30th. Uh, I'll do the easy one first, the Cape Cottage Fire Station, $1,000, that's simply because of heat. Uh, public Works, $65,000, that's uh, almost exclusively due to the winter we had, as I think we all uh, fondly remember, uh, over 100 mm -hmm. inches of snow, storm after storm after storm. The, the police department, I'm suggesting 10,000. The chief believes that the budget will be in balance, but I don't, I don't want to be in a position that, you know, we can't meet the payroll the last week of June uh, because something else has come up that is, is a bit of an emergency. But I don't expect we'll use any of that, but I would like to have it available. And then under the employee benefits, the workers' comp came in higher than expected. Uh, the uh, experience modification, if you recall, uh, had a 10 percent differential that wasn't anticipated. And we also had uh, the retirement pay for the uh, uh, fire chief as well, it, the, separate, the, the accumulated sick leave and accumulated uh, vacation time that uh, came out of that account. So I would recommend the, uh, the draft order. Okay. Yes. Madam Chair, could I ask a question of the man? How about if we have a motion first? And David? Um, in conformance with Article 5, Section 8 of the Council Manager Charter of the Town of Cape Elizabeth, I move that we transfer $35,000 uh, to employee benefits, $10,000 to the Police Department, $65,000 to Public Works, and $1,000 to Cape Cottage Fire Station. And is there a second? Second. Okay. okay. And Mike, these are these are amounts are being transferred to these indicated departments. Can you tell us where the money is coming from? Yeah. 
the, the overall municipal budget is expected to be in balance, but it's very close. Uh, so I'm not asking for an increase in the overall budget. Uh, for purposes of accounting, what this shows up is a revised <coughs> appropriation in these different areas. And it, it's, tr it's transferred out of all of those little pieces that are being saved in other places. For example, police crews, is this, there's about 73000 in the account. I've checked with the chief. And it's about $19,000 less we'll actually need for those cruises when they come in. Those monies have been accumulating. And, you know, I've been precise with him. We're only carrying forward. They won't be in by June 30. Um, we're only going to carry forward the exact amount that we need, no more. And it's by doing some things like that, we'll, we'll realize uh, these savings. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure the public understood that this that the overall budget will not be any higher. Yeah, but it is that's what be, I suspected, but I but wanted I, to. I want to be careful. It. It's going to no. be very close. The winter really, uh, uh, in what we do, is, it, it was really severe in terms of uh, the cost impacts. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further discussion, questions? All in favor? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to um, put the collective bargaining aside for a moment, and um, since there are still citizens here, this is the time for citizens' <laughs> discussion of items not on the agenda. So if there's anyone who would like to speak to an item that was not on the agenda, um, now is your opportunity. Okay. We will be going into executive session under 1 MRSA section 4056D, and I will restate that as a motion um, to discuss um, the status of collective bargaining. Um, we do not intend to take any action, so um, we will come out of executive session and just adjourn. Second the motion. Yes, so that's a motion for executive session. You're seconded. All in favor? 7-0. Thank you.